to climb the ladder of success, we all climb the ladder the same way. There is no skipping. We all start at the bottom and you slowly climb and every once in a while you're gonna fall and you go down a couple of steps but you'll always learn something and you get to the next step and then just know that every time you fall a step or two down you'll never go all the way to the bottom mm -hmm. and that's how you slowly climb you're gonna stub your toe because how you learn is from mistakes you don't learn when you're doing good because mm -hmm. you get a little careless it's those mistakes that hurt hurt the most of the ones that you'll remember. Yeah. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle. Or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts, this is the Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. Mr. Paul Hansma, I'm um... I'm grateful, I'm honored, very fortunate that you took time out of your day to sit down today. Um, for, for those of you listeners who may not know who Paul Hansma is or are not familiar with the cutting world, um, Paul won the Futurity back in 96 on Playboy McCray. He's now ranked as one of the top five NCHA trainers today with over $6.2 million in lifetime earnings. Um, Paul is originally from Alberta, Canada, moved here in 84. And um, one thing, like, uh, like I said, I've been in this cutting game for about a year and the name Paul Hansma keeps coming up and it comes up in a very positive way. Like nobody ever says any, I've never heard anything negative. I'm trying to think, uh, I think it was Cullen uh, Chartier. He, every time I see him, he's like, man, you gotta have Paul on your show. You gotta have Paul on your show. And even Matt Gaines, we had him on yesterday and your name gets brought up. And it's like, you've been a mentor to a lot of the cutting world, you know, and really just, it seems like you're willing to just share the knowledge that you have. And man, I think that is so cool. And um, I think that's also how we learn by, by teaching other people. So I'll shut up now. And um, I'm curious to know, so from Alberta, Canada was is cutting a big thing up there. And what was it that made you move in 84? Uh, what I'm assuming down to Texas? Well, I mean, we grew up in, around horses. We're farm boys. There's five brothers. We're farm boys. And, you know, we had horses. We had a farm. We had, I remember we raised pigs. I remember feeding pigs every morning and evening, and cleaning the pig pens and sows and feeding, you know, chores. And we also had horses. Showed 4-H. Uh, okay. AK, or horse 4-H. Did some open show stuff, you know. We started with ponies, Shetland ponies, and and then we um, did AQHA. And we knew about cutting because back then cutting and AQHA and all that stuff was together. So you know, every that was uh, you know, quarter horses were like all around horses. You did everything with them. So we knew about cutting. Some of our friends. And trainers in that world were cutters. You know, they trained cutting horses. They showed, so we knew about cutting. And I, but I didn't really do any kind of cutting until in my or in my twenties. Okay. Yeah. But we showed, you know, pleasure, showmanship, halter, all the everything that you would do at an AQHA show. I got you. Um, I started actually first doing because it's more Alberta is more rain cow horse. You know, Western, you know, like California a little bit. That's why I felt like anyways. And we snaffle bit a little bit. Okay. And that has cutting in it. And that was my first taste of cutting was at these little snaffle bit. And I remember that couple, some weekend shows and I had a snaffle bit horse and I'm getting ready for the fraternity. I've never done it before. How old are you at this time? I'm 21, 22. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I remember going to some of these, we never practiced cutting, you know, we just, there was some uh, ranch cutting classes. That's where you're allowed to use two hands, snaffle bit. 
I remember chasing them cows back into the herd, you know, missing cuts. Um, you know, and then you kind of start learning. Um, I really didn't get any good at it until my older brother, Winston, he come home that fall. He was, he spent some time down south in California. And he's told me, you know, he told me when I was making a cut, when those cows are rolling, to back up a little bit and stop that flow of cattle in it, and I could go stop a cow and go hold it. So my first taste in cutting was with the snaffle bit, because you have to do herd work, rain work, and fence work. Mm -hmm. So that was our first. Enjoyed it. I had a really good horse. My first good horse was really good. Um... My two, you know, really my two favorite buckles. I wear only really two buckles. I got this one on. It's a snaffle bit buckle that I won in 1983. Oh, yeah. On, you know, a mare that I trained. And um, then Winston came home. So there was three of us brothers, actually almost four of us brothers at home, and it was crowded. Bill Riddle come down in 1984, I believe, and did a clinic. I took it. It was really crowded at the house. You know, we're kind of training horses. Not seriously, not like they do down here. Working the farm and doing whatever. So, yeah, I think I'll leave for a while. So I asked Bill for a job. He'd give me a job, and, um, and that's when I left. Dad wanted me to go for six months. I said I wanted to stay there for a year, and I never left. I worked for him for four years. And that's what kind of got me to Texas. Right on. Yeah. Um, was that something in your head all along, like, I'm going to be a horse trainer, this is what I'm going to do, or, or were you bought into the idea that you had to go get a job? And, no, and no, you know, things? it was just working on the farm, just farm. You know, me... I never, I'm not that, like some people are really goal oriented. Me, I was just like, I moved down here, I showed these horses, I didn't have um, a goal like, man, I want to train horses, I want to win this, I want to do, no, I just was like, you know, I'm going to go show and, yeah. you know, and, you know, ended up having some talent and was, you know, and, and won and did well, but it, I didn't really... I moved down to Bill Riddle. I just working. I didn't worry about nothing. You know, I'm mm -hmm. pretty naive, pretty fairly naive about you know what was going on and what I needed to do. You know, money never motivated me. Um, I was just having fun. You know, I didn't have a goal. Yeah, I just went along with the flow. You know? Day to day. Yeah, day to day. Man, don't we all wish we could do that? <laughs> Just day to day. And then all of a sudden, one day when I was working for Bill after there for a few years, he had showed a horse and I was showing a little bit. And I finally said to Bill, I said, you know, and one day I was watching a cut and I think it was in Fort Worth. And I finally said, you know, I think I could do this. He says, but right now I think the horses that I could train, I'll probably mark a 71, you know, where Bill Riddle was at a, much higher level you know yeah I remember telling him that and I just kind of went from there you know I never went home I stayed with him he was great to work for and what about Winston did he come down at the same Winston time Winston come a or? couple of years later when okay. we were Bill Riddle actually got him a job with a guy in Fredericksburg and that's how Winston came down a couple of years after I was here I got you but he had worked in California a little bit he worked for the Charlie Ward, the, he, the, that family had Doc Bar, mm. and then another fella, Eddie Murphy, who was training horses in California too. Uh, so he worked, I don't know how long it was, before he come home, and that's when I left. And then Bill Riddle got him a job with a fella that was in Fredericksburg too, as their trainer. But gotcha. I worked to like... I actually worked for Bill Riddle as as an assistant. Winston went moved down there and was a head trainer for this guy. I got you. Yeah. Um, I've got some questions about that, um, about your experience with Bill. But I first want to I want to go back. Man, I visited Canada about two years ago. I went to Banff, mm -hmm. 
and I let everybody know the stereotypes are true. Are true. Like Canadians are nicer than Americans. <laughs> From my experience, I mean, everybody was just so pleasant and so nice, you know, whenever we went over there. Um, but I, I want to get back to Bill. We may bounce around a little bit, right? That's I have fine. ADD, and so we're going to talk. I want to talk about your successes. I want to talk about your failures, um, what you know, overcoming those failures, your mindset, and then of course we're going to touch on some horses as well. But um, what was in those five years you worked for Bill? What what was something that stuck out to you as like? It's such a broad question. I hesitate to ask it, but like, what was the thing you took away? You're like, man, that's some damn good advice that you still well, use today. What I learned from Bill Riddle it was consistency in training. Without him really telling us, I remember him saying, you know, really, uh, when you work for a horse trainer, all you really learn is the foundation of whatever discipline that you're in. So cutting, what I did, what I end up learning was just the, the basics of cutting. Because when you go out on your own, then you your personality has got to come out in <laughs> what you want to do. So what I learned from Bill, one, he was great to work for. You knew your job. You could go out there and do it and get it done. What I learned from Bill was get up every morning, get to the barn, go to work, get your job done. Next day you do the same thing again, just keep it up. Yeah. You know, he was very consistent about what he did, what horses we were going to ride. Everything was very consistent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the foundation of, I still do that today, basically. You know, you get up, work horses, get yeah. up, work horses, and do the same thing. Work on foundation. Really, that's what you learn when you work for somebody, just foundation. Right. What were you doing? Were you a two-year-old guy at the time? or were you? We did kind of everything, you know. Okay. Uh you know, obviously, you know, I'm sure glad I went to work for Bill Rilla because I could have worked for like Larry Reeder and, you know, those one of those guys that works 15 to 20 hours a day. I'm sure <laughs> glad I didn't go there, which, I mean, it would have been still a good experience, but sure. Bill Riddle had, you know, normal hours, you know, start at six and you could be done at normal hours. You know, we didn't work... You know, like I said, 15 to 20 hours a day, start at two in the morning. Right. Like, he, we didn't work as hard as, as many horses as James. Mm. No, never did. S still blows my mind anytime I go over Oh, there, yeah, right? he's just a uh, fiend. <laughs> yeah. You know, a machine. Yeah. 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 But that's what I learned from Bill, just that consistent, just like what all the good trainers do, just consistent, go to the barn, get things done, work. Yeah. Work consistently, and I think that's what he taught me a lot. And that seems to be the trend. Like anybody doing in any field, it does not just apply to cutting horses, but in any field, it, oh, yeah. that seems to be the trend. You do this thing consistently over a period of time, the compound effect takes over. Mm -hmm. And then muscle memory, what they call it. Exactly. Muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, consistency in training, you know, so they understand their job. Yeah. I think Horse we, get, and rider. we get hung up, and Matt and I were talking about this yesterday. We, we get hung up as humans. Um, we want the instant gratification. I want it now. And I'm guilty, just as guilty as anybody else, you know, but when I can really get my mind right and realize this thing's going to take a long time to really understand at the level I want to understand it. And uh, I think that's, that's when we grow, mm -hmm. you know, by sticking with it. But um, when did you, when did you, so you're, you're at Bill's, at what point did you realize, okay? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm good enough to do this for a living. You know what? I, I, I probably would have, you know, he quit training cutting horses, and that's probably the only reason why I left. I don't know how long I would have stayed there. I would have kept working for him. But at that moment, he was working, we were working for some people. They were Lebanese, very wealthy, and they also had running horses, thoroughbreds. And he was going to take over and do... Um, a Texas division for those people. And they were just starting to bring paramutual. They were trying to get paramutual bedding in Texas. So that place we were at, they were going to transfer it from cutters into running horses. And then that's when, or else I'd, I, I, did, well, I was not planning on going nowhere. You know, I was going to stay there, but he was, he quit. Yeah. Um, what are your mid-20s around this time? Uh, 28. Okay. 28. 
And that's when he got me a job or an interview with a, a non-pro cutter from California, George Stout. So I went from Bill Riddles. And I think there's some other, Bill, uh, Bill Freeman that maybe influenced him a little. May have put my name in the hat too, I, I don't know. There was another lady, Carol Rose, was inter kind of interviewed me about a job at the same time. And so I was talking to her a little bit. And I remember, well, I visited with Carol Rose and she told me, I, and I kind of had a figure in my head about what I needed to make, you know, I was like two grand a month, maybe 2,500, you know, and I remember telling that to Carol Rose and said, oh, no, no, I, I'm gonna have to start you off at 1,800. And I thought, well, that's no problem, you know. I remember sitting down with George Stout. We were at the, which not there anymore, Chili's office uh, off of University. It's where Eatsy's is now. And I remember sitting there and we're having, I don't know if it was lunch or dinner, but George was sitting there and I was sitting there, just the two of us. And I was taking a drink, you know, and he was, we visited a little bit. And uh, he said, I think I was taking a drink, you know. And he told me he was going to start me off at 3000 a month. I about spent my, <laughs> my iced tea all over him. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I blew that my, my figure out of the water. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so uh, um, going from there to winning the 96 Futurity, talk to me a little bit about that, about Playboy McCray. The preparation it goes into the futurity and then and then what that feeling's like to actually win it. Something that very few have done. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know what, back then I just worked horses. I mean, it, it wasn't like I did anything special, you know, just went and worked them every day and um you know, when you're younger, that 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 was me. I just worked. It wasn't like, oh, I got to do this and this and this. You know, I just was doing my thing that I had done all my life, you know, kind of my foundation, just like even, you know, we grew up with a snaffle bit and martingale. That's what we write everything in, snaffle bit and martingale. You know, that's how you start one. We wrote them like that almost their whole, <laughs> barely put a bridle on them, you know. And it wasn't like... I remember going to some pre-works, but it wasn't like I was blowing anybody out of the water. I didn't know if my horse was any good. Had you been to a futurity before that? Had oh yeah, seen? I mean, I've showed at the futurity once I started, I showed at okay. the futurity every year. So this was, you know, all that, I, I think I didn't show at the, I didn't show at the 84 futurity, but I think I started showing at the futurity in 1985 and then I showed every year, a horse. I think the first year I showed, I made the semifinals. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Bill Riddle was helping me. He was just, here, cut that cow, you know. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Yeah. But just kind of have a knack for it. I had a little knack for it. I knew how to stay between the cow and the herd. Yeah. You know. So I made the semifinals. And I, I couldn't tell you how many more finals or semifinals I made from years after that. But I remember I, I showed up to fraternity every year since since that so it wasn't my first time so 85 and then I won it in 96 made a few finals along the way and then once you get on your own you have to figure out and then you know when I worked for George Stout for two and a half years and then we moved to Bar H you know and that's where I trained Playboy McCray we were standing dual pep and he was by dual pep so I did well the first go round. I think I marked a 19, and the second go round I might have marked a 15 or a 16. So I'm in the semis easy. The semifinals, um, he wasn't that good. I had a miss, but luckily that was. I think I might have come in on the bottom hole. Mm. But I remember he missed that cow right at the end of my run. I remember kicking over there and get kind of kicked him where he needed to be and when he come out his mind changed like he just locked on i just felt it so the next morning of course we were also doubling up a little K 
K, uh, K, the owner, K. Floyd, showed him, and she made the semifinals while he quit cutting in the semifinals. And I remember taking him home, and I had to work him two or three times, and the morning of the semifinals was a couple of times. There was a couple of days in between. And then the semifinals, when he missed that cow and I kicked him over there, he locked on. So the finals morning, I may have worked like one cow for maybe about five or six moves. He just felt ready. Yeah. Just quit, you know, I don't know. I'm just gonna have fun, you know, I'm just having fun. You know, yeah. I made the finals and I don't have expectation on me. I'm not worried about it. I'm nervous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm not. So I remember showing and um, I cut my first cow and it's good. Cut my second cow, it's good. I remember cutting my third cow and I put my hand down and all I said the whole time was, you son of a bitch, don't you miss this cow. <laughs> you son of a bitch, do not miss this cow. You talking to yourself or do you I, well, worse? Both, <laughs> both. Because I knew I had a good run. Uh, you know, I didn't know yeah. what, how good, but I knew I had a good run because it was, you know, the crowd noise. But all I said on that last cow was, don't you miss this cow. Talking to both of us. Yeah. And we didn't. And um, you know, we, we won, it was exciting, you know. I, you know, I, was, I think I was the second last horse. And when that score come up, I threw my hat up in the air. And, <laughs> but there was still one horse left and we were all excited. And you know, the, I'm tied for the, I'm, I'm in the lead with one horse left. So, I mean, it's special, you know, it is special. That's what you all want to do. And I've been trying to get it again. Don't quit, don't, ever since then I haven't stopped. Yeah. Every year I'm trying to make the finals and every year since I've been wanting to win it. I want to tie Buster Welch's record. <laughs> yeah. You know. It's interesting. But I also want all my friends to win it. Yeah. But I want to win it some more too. Yeah. That's what's interesting about the game of cutting. You know, you have four guys turning back for you in the mm -hmm. very next run. You may be helping them. And helping them be turning you. back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's like... It's a genuine effort, like oh, all, yeah. from all oh, of yeah. those guys, you know, and um, yeah. Well, because you know, what you, I think what you learn is it doesn't matter what those other people are riding. You know, if you you can beat them, what you know, if you do your job, and mm -hmm. and then it gives you a little humility. Yeah, you had a quote. It says, "It's not the best horse." But the oh, best yeah. run that mm -hmm. wins the future. Where do you get all this stuff? <laughs> I it's haven't brought Google, it up. Man. It's huh? on Google. Oh, it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when I read that, I'm like, damn, that... that it is. It's it, not the best horse. I didn't have the best horse that night when I won the fraternity. He is the, he's very talented. But he wasn't a true cow horse. He's a cow reactor. He's not a true cow horse. And we had... Uh, uh, well, Matt Gaines' boss bought him after that, after the super, no, maybe it was before, I don't remember it was, but he wasn't a true cow horse. So he wasn't the best horse, mm -hmm. but he was that night. Yeah. Yeah. I need to see if you can help me explain this one, because people ask me all the time, friends that have never been around cutting, they don't understand what cutting is. So if somebody walks into the Will Rogers and they see a cutting going on, how do you explain cutting? And, and, and I don't necessarily mean to get into the history of cutting, but like if they're watching an event at the Will Rogers, how do you explain cutting simply? Well, I, I, I explain it, it's a game. And like basketball, and the cows are the other team. And my job is to sort a cow from the herd and then keep that cow away from its friends with as much style as possible. Conceptually, it's simple, right? And that's one of the best explanations I've heard of, right? <laughs> I don't know, but it, it you, is very simple, but it's hard to do. You start with a cow, you stop, you stop a cow. Yeah. And all the shit in between 
is what I, as an amateur, mm -hmm. I, I struggle with, you know, and a lot of that is feel and timing. Mm -hmm. um, what is your advice to somebody that may be starting out? Somebody like me that's an amateur, how do you teach feel? How do you teach timing? How do you teach <sighs> someone how to read a cow? Sore butt. You gotta put time in the saddle, practice. Not showing, you gotta go practice. And not just practice, you have to have good practice. And, and again, you got to learn, you know, feel your horse and then try to read what the cow is going to do. But I don't necessarily, I, when I train, I don't think of, I'm going to stop this cow. When I show, I think of holding the cow. Okay. And it's just a different mentality. It's the same thing. Yeah. And I try to keep it very simple. There's a, you know, really, you got to first be able to control your horse. And then it's really quite simple. You kind of like mirror image a cow. Okay. And stay between the cow and the herd and never push up and you can't fall back too much. So it's really that simple. Right. Rate, stop, draw, turn. Mirror image the cow. Right. If you can rate, stop, draw, mirror, image the cow, you're going to advance every go round. Yeah. It's one of those things, though, I think, um, as, again, I'm, I'm going to speak as an amateur, not knowing when to kick to stay even with the cow. Not knowing that when to stay even with the cow. That just takes time and then feel. I, I didn't know either. Yeah. And I had to learn. And it's just yeah. a, a matter of you have to learn. And there's only, you have to. To climb the ladder of success, we all climb the ladder the same way. There is no skipping. We all start at the bottom, and you slowly climb, and every once in a while you're going to fall, and you go down a couple of steps, but you'll always learn something, and you get to the next step. And then just know that every time you fall a step or two down, you'll never go all the way to the bottom. Mm-hmm. And that's how you slowly climb. You're going to stub your toe because how you learn is from mistakes. You don't learn when you're doing good because mm -hmm. you get a little careless. It's those mistakes that hurt the most are the ones that you'll remember. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree. they're just slow step, 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 and then you're going to fall back down. But you never will just like I got clients just like you. And they come over and practice a lot. I just tell them, you know, and they leave, have to go and then they come back for, you know, and they, oh, I just feel like I get rusty. I said, yeah, but you'll never start at the bottom anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You step that one step and you'll never fall all the way to where you never knew how to ride. Right. There is. And then, you know, you, yeah, you got up to this level and then you leave for a while and you haven't ridden in a month. You will come down, but it will never be all the way down. Yeah. And this next time you come, it'll be a little bit higher, and then a little higher, and a little higher. And that's the only way. That's how you train a horse. Same way. Right. Tell me this. So, I'm an old baseball guy. If you were to relate making finals to, like, getting hits in baseball, right? What is a batting average in baseball? What is a good batting average for making finals? If somebody what? starting out... Well, I mean, in the game of cutting. Well, I, I really, I use that analogy a little. What is one of the greatest hitters of all time hit over his career? You know, 300, 350, well, 400 maybe. Well, just think, he's striking out 70% of the time. Right. And he's got a career. And he's got, he's one of the greatest of all time. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of with cutting too, but that so doesn't you think happen. It's similar. I, I think it is. Yeah. Then you get into a role, those guys that are really good, just like you see those good hitters, they rise to the top. Cream will rise to the top. That happens with people, horses. Right. You don't do anything different. When I train horses at home, I don't do anything different from with this horse to that horse. How hard that is that That cream though? rises to the top. They're the ones that make me look good. How hard is that though when you ride a Sandman and you, then you, you have to you, go get on something well, I, that may not be as good of an athlete? Well, I, you just got to be a realist. Okay. So you, what you, I try to do is not go show those horses if I can help it. Why is that? 
not at the big events. When I feel like there, I used to, but anymore I try not to go show because it's hard on my psyche. Because you try hard, and when I walk out of that pen, if I don't do no good and I know my horse isn't good enough, it's a waste of your time, and you just psych yourself out a little bit. And I just, I try not to. I I'll weekend you. them. Yeah. Yeah. But I try not to, if I feel like that horse, well, before it used to be, if you had a good 72 horse, you can make the finals. Well, now you need a good 73 horse to make the finals. So I try not to show a horse that I feel like is a 72. Yeah. What? Um... I try not to do it personally. Now, there's other guys that do it, but I did all that. I'm 61 now, so I rode. I don't ride. I ride a third of the horses I used to do five years ago. Yeah. How many are in your barn right now? 20. Really? I used to have 60, 70. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you mentioned falling and getting back up and doing these things, and I agree with you 100%. That is when we learn, at least for me, that's when I learn the most. So I'm curious to know if you have a favorite failure or a perceived failure maybe at that time that led to the growth. And maybe later you look back and you said, oh, shit, yeah, I see why that had to happen. Or... Uh, you know, there's not a glaring one, but there's a whole bunch of little ones. Yeah. A whole bunch of little ones. Little, 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 you know, just little steps. To me, there's no glaring, you know, no. But that's my personality a little bit. I, 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 I it's water under the bridge. I don't dwell on the past. Um, where does that stem from? That, that's something that's, that's my personality. In, in baseball that's just that. my personality. I'm a little, like I said, I'm not, I'm fairly, I've always been naive, you know. I think people think the same way as me. Um, I, I'm, I'm naive that way. So you have a short memory. Well, that's what you, to be a really good horse trainer, there's another saying is to be a good horse trainer, you got to have a short term memory loss and a high tolerance for disappointment. <laughs> that's good yeah that's really good you have a quote that goes right along with that you know and um as a competitive person like i have these expectations but i think the biggest part of that and being able to handle expectations is not having an attachment to that expectation not letting a failure or, um, the outcome or result that I didn't want to have happen, um, not let that affect my day. So your quote says, things are going to happen the way they're going to happen. Step up and show like you don't have a care in the world. And that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. But it's so true though, oh, right? Yeah. Like when we do kind of let gotta, go of it. You it, just got to let it go, learn from it. Don't dwell on it. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> easier said than done but that's always been my goal and then also there's a another saying I like to use I like to use the I don't know if you know who John Wooden is why do you I know, know the name UC, I know UCLA the name? great UCLA basketball coach okay and, you know and his, one of his saying is don't make the highs too high so then the lows aren't too low so don't be so excited over a little win and then your lo the low won't be as bad so, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's great to win the fraternity or, you know, when you win a go-round. You know, you can pet your horse, but don't get so excited because then the lows are really hurt. Yeah. <laughs> so I always just try to stay right here. Yeah. I try I to keep it pretty even. So, and then that's always been my, my, my goal in my career. I, like, I always wanted consistency. So... I didn't want to be, you know, like, great, ooh, terrible. I always wanted this. You know, because what goes up must come down. So I wanted my down not to be too far. Yeah. And my up's not too high. Right. Because then the fall's not so far. Yeah. And that's always been my goal. I don't, I don't know if I really succeeded, but that's been my goal. Not too high, not just kind of like right here. Yeah. Whether I'm at, you know, in my early in my career, I felt like, you know, 
that my, you know, whatever level you're at, you know, so back then I felt like I could maybe mark a 71 horse at spec and say 85 and six. So, you know, and now you want your expectation. So it's higher when you want to mark a three or you're good enough to mark a three. Consistent threes is always, you know. Yeah. Did you ever feel that though? Like the pressure of expectations, either you put on yourself or others that are like, yeah, well, Paul's doing pretty damn good, you know? Oh like, yeah, I mean, you have to learn how to deal with it. Yeah, there's expectations, it's easy. I mean, I've Buster Welch saying, it's easy to get to the top, the hard part stay in there. <laughs> you know, and no one expects stuff, it's easy to be the underdog. Yeah. And yeah. I remember, you know, training, I was, you know, young, I, I remember there's some articles, you know, this young, upstart hot young trainer well after a while you're not the hot young trainer anymore you're the hot trainer and then <laughs> expectations on you do you but uh, but that's life either you step up and deal with it or you don't and you and you don't hear from them anymore type deal right right yeah um i read a lot of stoic philosophy and i think that's one of the biggest things is um, to feel the feels, you know, whether it's good or bad, but don't be, don't become overwhelmed with any of it. Whether you're having a great amount of success or the failures, like you're saying, kind of float right that's here. What I that's what always been my goal is to be just consistent. Where does that, where does that mindset come from? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people that would love to have that mindset. And then how do you practice that and, and have enough awareness to catch yourself when you're too high or too low? Well, by screwing up. I remember at some of those shows, and you know, we used to go to 15 or 20 year, and you know, I got a horse to win it, I can win it. Well, that's when I screw up. When you start thinking about winning, you just think about showing, and then the winning comes. Mm. How I learned is by screwing up. When I thought, man, I could win it, I'd override my horse, try too hard, you get less. Yeah, so you're focusing more on the process versus the outcome. That's how it worked for me. Because when I thought about the outcome, man, I wouldn't mind that, that check there. I'm, I got a horse to win it. And people telling you, man, you're Paul, you got a horse to win it. And if I let them think about if I thought about that too much, yeah, down in the dumps. <laughs> Screw up. <laughs> Last whole spot. Yeah. So you learn, you know. It's yeah. great to screw up in the finals. Yeah. But that's how you learn. I mean, by messing up, that's how you learn. You don't learn from your successes. You learn from those mistakes. So is your mindset different, your strategy different, going into a first go-round, second go-round, semis, and then the finals? It's all basically the same. The next round is always the toughest. Whether it's the first round, second round, semifinals, it's yeah. all the same. Yeah. I'm curious to know, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like to know your opinion on this, right? So cutting horse trainers are probably some of the hardest, hardest working people that I've ever been around. The, the folks that are doing it on your level. So everybody's working hard, but what is it that separates the goods from the greats? Those names that you're gonna remember for decades to come cream rises to the top. Whether you are lucky, God blessed you with ability. With your mind or whatever, that's how I look at it. It's just, I'm not doing anything different than anybody else. In my opinion, God blessed me with this talent that I, I don't know. I mean, I grew up with, you know, five brothers, you know. They're all good hands. Or all these guys. What I've always looked at though, it's quality of horse that's put me on top. Like I said, I think, you know, my journey or whatever you want to call it, you know, doing that rain cow horse helped me. It, it, again, the youth take over. That next generation's better. I learned from Bill Riddle. He taught me the foundation and then, well, all these young kids that work for me, they're gonna step up and beat me. The youth take over. That's the way it's always been. Yeah. And just think, just like in football, baseball, why is the game so much better? 
Well, that's because they learn from those guys. And then you got that foundation and they, they you step it up a level. Yeah, implies the horses too, right? Well, the horses too. Horses are getting Horses better. are better bred. There's better horses. There's more better horses. But back in the day, you know, when I won the fraternity, there's maybe four or five good horses and then a whole bunch of average ones that you can make the finals on. Well, now every trainer's got a good horse. So there's a lot more better horses, a lot better quality horses and a lot more quality trainers. Mm-hmm. And quality horses make the trainer. Again, yes, I had a knack, but also those horses just kind of fell into my lap. It was awesome. Like again, it's more of a blessing than anything. Yeah, I did not work. I did not work. Everybody. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't work the hours that. You know, James and Casey Green and J.B. McClam. Oh, I can name almost everybody outworks me. I'm just consistent. You mentioned, you alluded to it earlier, though. You said something about the mind. And that seems to be a consistent theme with the people that I sit down with who are elite in their field. There's a different mindset around it. Well, you have to tell me. I, I don't know what it is. I mean, you, you're probably, you know, again, that's not my mentality. It was always just kind of keep plugging along, and yeah, and it worked for me. I, I can't tell you what I did different than anybody else. I always, I always, you know, I, I, again, those horses just kind of fell into my lap, and. Um, even, even I remember back in the day, I remember I never wore a pair of spurs really on a horse until, I remember at the first fraternity, my snaffle bit fraternity, I never wore spurs. We never, I never had a pair of spurs on a horse. Really? Hmm? I had, you know, dad's theory was you learn how to use your feet. Before you need spurs. Yeah. And I remember the first spurs, and I think it was on uh, Super Poo, I finally got a pair of spurs. And that's my snaffle better. But that first show I showed her on, I didn't show her in spurs. But she was just naturally talented. And then from then on, every oh, the only spur I ever used was a cloverleaf, the dullest spur you can get. And then one of her daughters is uh, Hickapoo. She was a real sticky mare. And I remember I finally, toward the end of her, before I showed at the fraternity, I put some 10 points on because I didn't think she's, well, I don't know if I can get her across the pen. She's so sticky. Really? But that was cow. Hmm. That was cow. She was just smart about it. She wasn't going to expose herself. Yeah. Tell me that. So I'll ask that same question, but we're going to relate it to horses. So what is it that separates the goods from those that just stand out and make you the horses? Hair? Yeah. It's their mind. Mind and ability. Just like a person. Just like what made Michael Jordan Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky. There's lots of guys with that. They're just as athletes just as athletic. They just have different minds. Yeah. It's just the mindset of that horse. And that's born in them. Right. I'm curious to know from you, Paul, when at your level, how do you continue to learn? How do you continue to improve on your craft? Well, you just, you watch. That's what I've always, I've always been a person that watches people, other people work. I don't, you know, we're, you know, even I watch and then I try to imitate them. That's the way I've always done it. Even today? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You still watch people work. What bridle does he use? What training rig does he got? I've got so many, so many training rigs and bridles. 
But I still go back to my foundation snaffles. I still work almost exclusively with snaffle and a little correction bit with a martingale. German martingale or just a regular martingale. Someone says that we changed, when me and Winston were working together, we changed cutting by holding a line. Before, they used to kind of work that arc. Mm. You know, because back fence rule was important back then. It's obsolete almost now, a back fence. If you hit a back fence, you're done. Right. <laughs> so, and they credit us with, you know, holding the line. And you know what Winston's answer, and it's very true. He says, I don't know what we did. I said, we were just trying to get them to cut. <laughs> We weren't like, hey, you know what, they're holding, they're not holding that line very good. We're going to step up there. No. It, there's no, we were just trying to get them to cut. And then I think, because I learned from the generation before, and then we go to here, and then all I know is I'm not really doing anything a whole lot different. I'm just still, just I'm just trying to compete doing my thing. Mm. Now it's... Because now I know, and my opinion is, the quality of horse is what makes me, that separates the top 50 trainers, wherever they are. There might be 75 or the top 30. I believe whoever's got the nicest horse is, separates me. If I got a 71 horse or a 72 horse, that's all I got. Yeah. No matter how good you no are. No matter who's the rider. Yeah. It's no different. We're kind of like, it's just, uh, it's like no different than I, I, if I want a better horse, I better go recruit it. I better go find one and bet recruit it. And, or, you know, you get, it, it, it's like last year, you know, we started off after the fraternity. Last year, you know, I was the, um, we didn't have very good four-year-olds. I wasn't mounted very good at all. You know, they weren't any good. So instead of instead of keep going and going to those shows, I said, you know what? Let's not go. Let's go to some of these. Uh, let's go to some of these. You know, these weekend circuits. You know, let's go to Queens Creek, Arizona. You want to do that? We got two nice. We had some a horse that just turned seven, and another horse that just turned eight, and that's what we did. So to me, again, it's quality of horse. Hmm. Um, I'm going to ship gears on you. We're talking about the NCHA a little bit. So you've been around for a long time. I'm curious to know what you think the biggest change has been since you started cutting uh, to now. And then also what you think could be done if you think that anything needs to be done to improve the sport or maybe to gain more... Um, exposure for the sport of cutting. What's different? I mean, cutting, the basics of it's the same. Right. Two and a half minutes, right. you've got to cut two cows, three, can't do any more. So basically, cutting's the same as it was when it started. So the big difference is, you know, quality horse, you know, the cattle have changed it and the horse have changed it, and then we have more, better, more educated uh, trainers. The cattle changed it and then the horse power changed it and then you know that makes the trainers better. So there's really nothing that's changed in cutting because they got basically the same rules you know a miss is a miss you can't move your hand you know. Yeah. So really cutting hasn't changed it's just gotten there's no no um it's like football. You, the ball hasn't changed. Yeah. <laughs> Basketball. Yeah. It's just they're better athletes out there. People work at it. Nutrition, um, quality horses, better vets. We know how to keep a horse sounder, and that's all evolved. I mean, back then when no one injected hawks and took, you know, knew if a horse was sore, we just thought they were gotten sorry. <laughs> no, they were sore. Yeah. You know, so we we know more about anatomy and why they're getting sore and all that stuff that's made you know, with the vet work, the shoe and quality of horse, all that's 
come into play that makes everything better. Right. Yeah. How do you make it more of a spectator sport? How do you how do you get more eyeballs in the arena? That's a hard question. I mean, I, I, you know, I really I don't know how to answer that really. It's one of those things it, that stump me. It, but... It's a slow it's a slow event. You know, I mean, yeah. the only I, you know I mean they ever have to experiment with. Um, you know, only a two minute clock or, you know, or something like that where you don't cut so much and you have yeah. to hurry up and go down there. That, that I mean, that's, um, that is the hard part. Cattle are the hard part. Bad cows make for a bad show, low scores, takes forever to settle. That, that's the, we have some things in place that, that's the foundation of cutting. I mean, you know what cutting is, you know, it's a cow, you have to have cattle. I mean, that's our, you can't change that. Right. Money, you know, the, the purse makes a difference. But times are so different now than they were back in the heyday of cutting, you know. Times are so different. There's so much place, there's so many places for everyone to go do some, you know, they got ranch cutting now, you know, and uh, you don't have to be at this. I mean, the thing with cutting, especially at the high level, it's a really intent, disciplined sport that you can't do half halfway. Yeah. And so, but there is other levels, you know, just like, you know, there's different, you know, team sorting and, you know, team pinning. There was team pinning, but I think, I don't know, just is team sorting kind of taken over a little bit of the team? I don't know. But there's, there's, I mean, they have so many, you know, even the rain cow horse, you know, they have the ranch and they got ranch pleasure classes and yeah. unbelievable stuff that there's so much more to do with a, a horse that you don't have to have quite as much training. Right. Right. It is a commitment. And I've learned that over the last year of getting in this world. And it's very esoteric. Very discipline specific, um, but I was—that's what blew my mind. You know, sitting at Futurity last year, I'm like I'm looking around, and hell, it's the semifinals, and there's open seats everywhere, and it was a badass semifinals, mm -hmm. right? I mean, cattle were tough, but it was still. Well, the, generally, that's COVID. Generally, the Coliseum is packed for the semifinals, and there's actually empty seats for the fin finals. Okay. Generally, that's COVID. I got you. At the fraternity, that's our. We have really two packed performances a year, and that's the fraternity. I got you. And usually, the semifinals is more packed than the finals. It's a dog but fight times to get have in. changed. You know, yeah. people stay home and watch it online. But COVID was last year, so you can't really judge it from that. I got you. I got there you. There was quite a bit of empty seats. Yeah. Yeah. What's the answer to that? To that, put it put it on delay on online or, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's the hard part with um, with our sport. There is problems, not problems, but it's just the way, you know, the cow settling and stuff that um, cause you. You know, I mean, just that delay. So either we got to, we have to figure out. I mean, do something, you know, during the cow settling. You know, you know, you have entertainment that's in another building, not mm. just that draws people in, you right. know, and you have a, an entertainer that's in the other building or something that gets people to come in that have nothing to do with cutting. They come to see only, like yeah, yeah, yeah. they do at Billy Bob's, say. Right. And that would be, to me, the only way, so when they're, and you, then you might get, five or six people that'll actually come back in and watch the cutting, you know, but they got to have something to do for the settling. Right. Because that is a killer. Yeah. It's interesting. It's just, it's one of those things. Um, I don't, that, I don't that, really that have an answer for that. in my head. Yeah. But I don't have an answer for that. It's, that's the hard part about it all. Yeah. Um, here's a question I like to ask, um, especially guys like you who have done what you've done. Um, so, with the knowledge you have now, if you could go back in time and give your 20-year-old self, 20-year-old Paul Hansma, any advice 
And this will be two part. As a horseman, and then also in your personal life, what what advice do you go back and give yourself? Oh, professionally, I don't think I would do it a whole lot different. I, re I really it's like there's I really don't have no reg uh, I don't have a whole lot of regrets. Other than there is some skeletons in the closet that I wish I you know just being a wild young you know man that. It's a little embarrassing now, but that's how also that's I've learned. I've learned from those experiences there. So there's right. really, you know, there's not a whole lot of, you know, because I had success when I and you can't you can't rush that. So I, I was doing, you know, doing well. So I, I liked that I was a little naive and I wasn't knowing exactly what was going on and. Sometimes that's the best the best way to be, right? We don't know what we don't know, and we just go do. That, that, that's kind of, that was that's the way I did it. You know, I, I just kind of was, you know, happy go lucky. Let's have fun. When I was loping horses for Bill Riddle, I was having, you know, talking to my friends and loping. <laughs> you know, when you used to have to lope a horse for three or four hours, you know, and, yeah, yeah. you know, um, I just was having fun while we were working. Maybe wish the only thing I could say I wish I was a maybe a better disciple of Christ a little earlier. Or, you know, that would be the only thing I wish I would have done a little bit more. I got you. That would be the only thing that I probably regret the most is it's the same thing. Someone asked me who my favorite horse is, and I have had some good horses, but I'm. I'm in, even at this stage in my career. I hope I haven't. I'm I'm looking to come across my favorite horse yet, that I can win the triple crown on. Mm -hmm. I haven't won the triple crown, so I've had some nice horses. Came close. No, no. I mean, I've won this class and won that class, so I can't say I've come close to the triple crown. But I want, I want you know to win the fraternity like Buster Welch win it four or five times so I haven't come across that extra special horse now, I've had horses that have defined my career that helped me and that was kind of like my snaffle bitter and then one of her daughters made me look good Hickapoo mm -hmm. and she had a couple of other daughters that I did fairly well with but she was probably the one I had most consistent on but so someone asked me I mean I I'm, I'm hoping that my most favorite horse is still in my future. And then that. you, so then you, you keep driving. Yeah. Yeah. To me, that's what keeps me kind of going is because I'm hoping that special horse is still in front of me. Yeah. I think it was Kara Brewer that uh, I was interviewing last year sometime, and she's like, that's why horse trainers never commit suicide. They're always waiting for that next two year old that next to come along. Yeah. That next special horse. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but um, I'll rephrase that question a little bit. So, if there's a young, maybe if there's a young, um, it can this could apply to any field. Like if there's somebody that a young guy or girl wanting to pursue horse training as a career, what is your advice to those guys? If they're on the fence and they're like, ah, I feel like I need to well, get a job. Well, it's a or, good. It's you're not going to get. Don't do this thinking you're going to be. You know, get make millions and millions of dollars. This is a, a, a lifestyle, um, and you should need to enjoy the process because there's lots of frustrations. And to me, it's it really is, you know, a good business because um, you're not punching a time clock. Mm -hmm. You work as hard as you want to. Learn from your mistakes, uh, you know, and, and it, it's a process. And, I, you know, again, I don't think it's any different than any other sport or any other business. Mm -hmm. And the way I look at it, too, you know what, I don't care if you're a doctor. There's, you know, there's, say, 100 trainers. There's 10% or a certain percentage that are the elite. And then there's this bunch. And then there's this bunch, and I don't care if you're a doctor, or a lawyer, or an investment banker. There's the elite, here's the middle class, 
And then there's these ones down here. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same with what we do. The only difference is I will never become and have the money like some of my clients have. But I'm okay with that though. Right. I'm okay with that. Always had, it's never been my, that didn't, it's that didn't drive me. It's an interesting point though, because you're doing what you love to do, right? Yeah, yeah, you gotta really, really enjoy it, yeah. Yeah. I find that question fascinating, like the, what is the relationship we all have with money, you know, and. Uh, well, you have to have money to survive. You yeah, know? it's a I thing. Mean, I get, you know? I totally get it, but I think as, you, as a young, you know, from, again, I only speak for myself, but growing up, that's what I was taught to value, my environment, my surroundings. I was, and a lot of people are the same way, I believe. Like in America, we're taught to live the American dream, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and what we really want to do kind of takes a back seat, you know? And, uh, yeah. and again, I'm only going to speak from my own experience. So um, going into, I was in pharmaceutical sales for a long time and uh, I hated it. It was corporate and um, I found other ways to get out. I'm now a real estate investor and I get to do my own thing. But I was just curious to know that um, your perspective on that and, and any advice that you may have for those guys that may be on the fence and may be outside influences or trying to tell them go down this road when they well, really yeah, want to go I down mean, this road. Yeah, but I mean, I think even you hear that all the time from like I, I listened to Matt Gaines say he grew up in the business and his dad says you don't want to be a horse trainer you don't want to be a horse trainer it's tough well you end up being a horse trainer because that's what end up you got to do whatever you do you got to, just like for you if you don't love it you're not going to be very good at it mm -hmm. me and these guys were talking about it yesterday it's like do you do the thing you love to do or do you, and maybe not make that much money, or do you do the thing that you may be really talented at, well, but you I hate mean, you to know, do Life it. is about balances, <laughs> you, know? you know, and I, I don't know how to answer that question because I'm, I'm used to think about that a lot when we were, you know, man, if I was a country singer, say, or a singer, yeah. and I had that number one hit, I could retire just like that's one horse. I won the fraternity on, that's the number one hit, say, yeah. you know. So along the lines of, the, of money, somebody brings you a check tomorrow for $100 million or any amount of money that where you don't have to work again a day in your life. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically speaking, what do you do the next day? Well, I mean, I, if people ask me what am I gonna do if, when I retire, I don't, I don't know what I do. I don't know. Someone, what do I do if someone brings me a hundred million dollars? Yeah, like you don't have to worry about money. Like that's in the bank. You're, you're, you're good. Anything you want to do. Well, I mean, I would in, invest it. I don't know if I would keep working. I would. Um, I would donate a lot of it because I know I so if so, like say I don't if it was say a hundred million, I'd figure out how much money I needed to live on, and then I would start doing something with that money for people that needed it. This is what I would do. Like I'm not a boat boat person. I don't need to have a yacht. Um, I'm not sure if I'd keep doing what I'm doing. Since, you know, um, since, uh, well, my life has changed this last two and a half years ago. My wife got injured. So my life perspective is a lot different mm. than it was three years ago. You know, she's injured and. And she's not the, you know, the person that she was. We don't have the life that we used to have. So my life perspective is a lot different than what it was. You know, I'm a Christian. I know we're put on this earth to build character for the next life. Whether you are going to heaven or hell, 
I'm trying to do what's right so that um, and be a believer and being a good example to other people that maybe they can become uh, believers and so that you have a purpose in life because we're, we're, we all come into this world the same way and we're all going to leave. A, so that hundred million in the long run doesn't mean squat to me because I'm not taking it with me. So I'm just going to figure out a way to use that money to, to make sure other people are blessed also. Mm. Whether it's with health or um, bringing the, the, you know, the Christian word to everybody. You know, that's what I believe. I believe in the Christian values, you know, biblical values. Kind of what, you know, even without really knowing it, that's really been, you know, our whole family's been, you know, we try to do... I think, you know, that mom and dad taught us that about without even really knowing it, you know, we were, you know, had like real good Christian values, you know, treat people right, be friendly, you know, doesn't matter who they are, you know, who, mm -hmm. you know, we never, and um, we continue that. Treat everybody like you want to be treated. I mean, it's, it's in the Bible, you know. Right. Yeah, you know, so simple, right? Yeah, it's kind of like cutting. It's awful yeah. simple, but it's hard to do. We humans <laughs> tend to complicate that thing. Yeah. But I love that perspective, Paul, and I think that is just uh, that just shows why there are so many people that respect you in the, the world of cutting and who you are as a human being. Um, so we'll shift gears and uh, we'll go to that what... Was enough of that deep stuff. Well, no, that's good. I love the deep stuff, man. I could live there, and I could we could sit here, and I'm um, trying to be respectful of your time. Um, but, yeah, no, man, good. I could sit here for a few more hours and chat with you. So um, going to what used to be called the rapid fire, it never, nothing was rapid about it, so I now call it the slow fire round. Oh, all right. <laughs> and it's brought to you by Ghostwood Distilling Company, and um, we'll roll into it. So I know you travel a lot for shows, and um, I'm curious to know, but what is, what is one place that um, you've never been, but you'd love to visit? Um, in, in, like in, in the horse business or just? Anything. I mean, I'd like to go to either. Australia. Oh yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't mind touring around Australia. No specific place? You know what, it would be fun to, there's a road all the way around Australia. I would I would like to take that. No shit. What's yeah. the name of it? I don't know. But <laughs> I know there's a road that goes all the way around the perimeter. I've watched shows and read, you know. Yeah. On yeah. that, I would I'd like to do that. Yeah, it's on my radar for sure. Uh, <sighs> Australia, no specific place. But. Yeah. Um, if you could go back in time hypothetically speaking, and live for one week in any time period, any time, when would that be and why? In biblical times, I would like to have known personally, would be to known what it was like. Oh, I would guess the when they crucified Jesus and the, and the resurrection. I guess, you know, when I think about that, that would be pretty awesome to, to be a fly on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great answer. Yeah. That's not rapid fire. Come on. That's why it's slow <laughs> fire. That's why I changed it. <laughs> All my fault. Um, I, I want to know your answer to this. So... Sitting in that cow box at, at Will Rogers, to me, it's like, I've only spent a, a handful of times in there, but to me, it reminds me of like being in a locker room, you know, you kind of oh, yeah. out with your buddies and mm -hmm. sitting in there bullshitting. Um, what is the best one-liner, best story that comes to mind that you've heard while sitting in that cow box? Oh, we just gossip a lot. <laughs> Some of it's gossip. Yeah, I, you know, we tell jokes. Again, 
I'll probably have an answer to that question here tomorrow. Okay. It'll pop I'll into my head. You know what I'm saying? There's been so yeah, many, yeah. and there's not really one that pops into my head. We all we had a lot of you know. Again, we have a we have a, a, I try to do, and a lot of guys do. We have fun while we're working. Mm -hmm. Or else you just go nuts sitting yeah. in that coliseum for three weeks doing the same thing all the time. Right. Um, so right at this moment, nothing pops into my head. I'm sorry. I can't answer good. that question. I'll, to the listeners out there, I'll let you all know what Paul says at the next show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I'm going to hit you up. <laughs> yeah. I, there's been so much. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what's a three-year-old three horse that uh, you would love to have back again? Um, whether it was because that horse was just super talented or maybe because you do you do things a little different the next go round. Oh, there's quite a few of those. All of those ones I would like to have back to see what they were like, you know. I mean, all of them I would... There, there's, again, there's not that one special one. There's a whole bunch of them. So I can't say maybe... Uh, one that pops into my head would be, say, a horse called Classical CD. She was a moving around rascal, and we end up finding she had some kissing spine in her back and stuff. And I wish we could have. And there, I found out later there's a couple other ones I wish that we would have known that. Again, we go back to why are the horses better nowadays because we know we can find problems out we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. I would like to give her another chance. Because I think that caused her inconsistency. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. What, um, what's an unusual habit or hobby maybe that, that most folks don't know about Paul Hansma? Well, I, I, I'm, I like to cook. And since COVID, I have been baking bread. And um, habit... Now, the only habit I get teased a lot with is when, since I've been wearing glasses, every time I quit a cow or I'm working, I'm always pushing my glasses up, even though they don't need to be. <laughs> it's a, it's a when pick. I'm showing, I just go <laughs> pushing my glasses on. That That's a kind of an unusual habit that we all get. We all do something in the show pen that yeah. you don't know you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about contacts? They don't work? I've never tried it because I never did like, well, these are bifocals and I didn't know mm. that you could do that too well yet and I haven't tried it, but I never was really into, I hated touching my eyes and I don't know if I could do that yeah. to put a contact in or take them out. You mentioned the show pen. Um, I'm, I'm always curious to know, like, when you ride out, do you look at what your score is or do you wait till you get out? Are you looking at that scoreboard whenever you write out? Oh yeah, I mean that's why we do it for. I'm listening. What you know? What do we? What do we score? Yeah, yeah. Do you usually have a pretty good idea? Like you know, okay, I marked a two there, um, three there. A lot of times I'm surprised. Man, that. I, a lot of times I'm like, man, that must have looked a lot better than it felt. <laughs> and people don't realize that, you know, just like you. Yeah. You don't realize is, you, you know, again, that's something that Bill Riddle taught me many, many years ago, one of the first few years. He said, never tell the judge you're not liking it. In your face, when you're showing at a big event, never let the judge know you're not liking it. Because they don't know. Just like that. So he taught me. Mm. A little more poker face. Yeah. What is that? That comes with practice. Well, yeah. I mean, Having a poker face. Well, yeah, don't tell me. But that's like, you know, it's rare that you really like what's going on in the show pen, how good your horse is working. You are always doing something. Either you're leaving them alone or you're helping them or he needs to be up. He needs to stay up. He needs to get off. Yeah. A little too short here. Oh, a little long over here. We're always just like driving that car out there. It doesn't drive itself. Right. So you have to do the driving, and that horse is going to be better or worse, you know, and you're always. Yeah. 
and everything's amplified or it feels like it's magnified when you're sitting in the saddle and you're in well the yeah pit. because you know it's you, you got seconds to respond yeah and it's got to be a habit that you have to develop it it doesn't just happen yeah some people a little more natural but you all we all had to learn how to do that just like myself I felt like I could mark a 71. Well, how do you get a 71 to, but just your timing. Yeah. Again, you have to develop that. Right, right. Um, In any discipline that you do. What are, what is, um, what's a book, Paul, that you've either reread most or that you've gifted to other people the most? Uh, It can be horse related, it can be. Something you know, totally I, I, I remember I give some books to way back when it was, I think it was Jim Lair. And he was a tennis coach. And I remember reading that and I give that book to a couple of people. In horse related type deal. And I'm, I'm mostly into novels. I just oh. read a novel just for entertainment value. Is what I like to do. I don't read. What's, I've read some autobiographies, you know, stuff like that. Do um, you remember the last one you read? Your latest autobiography. I'd have to pull it up on my phone because since the since Julie's since my wife's accident, I really haven't read much. I kind of zone out on TikTok. <laughs> oh, really? You're on TikTok? Are you on the social? Are you on Instagram no, or Facebook? No, well, I look at now. I'm. Not, I don't. I have a. Facebook page, but I don't even know how to pull it up. <laughs> the girls the and all I my help. The girls and all my help keep it up. I got you. Before I started this show, <laughs> like I didn't have, I didn't understand social media. Yeah. Still don't understand Facebook, but um, yeah, I'm yeah. With you. No, but I TikTok, it's just because it's just uh, it's uh, entertaining. Yeah, it can be inspirational. Yeah. Well, Paul, uh, again, I'm grateful for your time, my friend. Thank you for coming in and, and spending it with me. I and, enjoyed uh, it. And sharing your wisdom and, and dropping some knowledge here on the Converse Cowboy Show. And um, I got to think you're going to be at just about every aged event for the rest of the year. Are you hauling this year? Let folks know like, um, you what know, you got my, going on. Well, I mean, we're going getting ready for the BI. You know, that we'll starts there. on the 12th. We're going there. I'll be the whole show. But like I said, my life's a little different than what it was. I used to go to the you know, 15 or more aged events a year. And um, I don't have that many horses um, anymore. Um, We cut back on purpose. And so, you know, I enjoy, I would, um, I enjoy uh, some short weekend stuff and uh, not hitting them all train horses, get my people lessons, do some clinics. Mm-hmm. I do a couple a year. They're good money. Around, around the... Well, I've done, like, last year I did one in um, northern Alabama, and I just finished one not less last weekend, the weekend before I was in uh, the tri-city areas of Washington State. Okay. I did a two-and-a-half day or there. Right on. So you like that. There's a reason why people say that there, well, I mean, there's so many, teachers. yeah, we're you've been teacher. so many people in that world, man. And uh, I'm sure you realize that you may or may not realize no, how many lives you've touched, you know, no, or I helped don't. out in some way. Um, but I see why after sitting down with you and getting a glimpse into who Paul Hansma is, it definitely makes sense. And uh, it's uh, like you said, we don't take anything with us, but we do leave stuff behind. And I think knowledge is one of the best things we can leave behind. Hopefully. Yep. Yep. That's my plan. (laughs) Alrighty, my friend. Well, thank you again. And uh, best of luck for the rest of the year. All right. Well, thank you. Yes, sir.